delighted to welcome you to this session of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by the tall Banega Swast India. The session is presented by Blue One Inc. and is part of the Mind and Soul series. It is our pleasure to present today, exposing the fault lines, the pandemic, and mental health. Shekhar Shishadri, Neerja Birla, and Aparna Piramal Raje in conversation with Shelja Sen. We live in an age of accelerated anxiety and the prospect of loss tears us in the face in the times of the pandemic. A deep session that examines the constantly evolving and overlapping nature of the pandemic with our mental health and the public need for and response to general well-being in the midst of the largest medical crisis of recent times. Shekhar Shashadri. Shekhar is a child psychiatrist and former senior professor Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, Nimhans. With over 35 years of experience in the field, his work has extended beyond the clinical population to children and childcare institutions across India and South Asia. He was an active part of the National Deliberations on the POXO Act 2012, and more recently, the December 2015 Juvenile Justice Act. Neerja Birla. Neerja Birla, a passionate educationist and a mental health champion, is the founder and chairperson of Aditya Birla Education Trust. Winner of many national and international awards, she currently holds the G100 Global Chair Mental Health and serves as the trustee of the Mumbai Police Foundation. Aparna Piramal Raje. Aparna Piramal Raje writes on business design and workplaces. Her first book, Working Out of the Box, 40 Stories of Leading CEOs was published in 2015. Based on head office, her popular monthly column in Mint, it looks at leadership through the unique lens of workspaces and work styles. Shailaja Sen. Shailaja Sen is a narrative therapist, writer, and co-founder of Children First Institute of Child and Adolescent Mental Health. She's a TED speaker and a columnist with the Indian Express, and author of three critically acclaimed books, All You Need Is Love, Imagine and Reclaim Your Life. Sen is a clinical tutor at the University of Melbourne and the International Faculty at Dulwick Center Foundation, Adelaide, Australia. Please feel free to send in your comments by typing them in the comments section. Do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. Please tweet using Hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2022 and tag at Jaipur Litfest. Ladies and gentlemen, exposing the fault lines, the pandemic and mental health. Shekhar Shishadri, Neerja Birla and Aparna Piramil Raje in conversation with Shelja Sen. Over to you, Shelja. Exposing the fault lines. In this session, we will be talking about the pandemic and mental health. As we slowly start recovering from the brutal impact of the COVID, it becomes so important for us to make sense of the last two years, to take a vantage point and look at the landscape of mental health. There's been so much of talk about mental health, but still there's so much of silence, shame and stigma. In many ways, COVID has exposed the fault lines of our society and magnified them. And therefore, how crucial it becomes for us to talk about the pain and the suffering, but also talk about what we have to do differently, what will heal us and how we can come together to do something about it. I'm so excited to be here to navigate this conversation on the pandemic uh, and mental health with Shekhar Shishadri, Nirja Birla, and Aparna Piramil Raji. And I'm going to actually dive right in, and I'm going to start with a question for Aparna. Um, Aparna is going to be bringing out her book very soon, uh, and I have her manuscript with me. And right at the beginning, of the introduction, she begins, 
I have lived with bipolarity, classified as a serious mental illness for over two decades. I believe you can have a mental health condition and raise a family, be in stable, loving, supportive relationships with close family and friends, study at leading educational institutions, turn around a company, write a book and a popular column, teach students, give a little back to society, travel around the world, fail at learning the piano and fall off a horse and get back on again. And uh, Apanda, you talk about radical transparency. Uh, and I kind of jump to the chapter eight and I'm going to just quote a line from there where you say, not being successful enough, not talented enough, not clever enough. This is a theme that I hear while working with, you know, and when you use these words, I, I, it's like an echo for me because this is something I hear from children and youth all the time and more so during the pandemic. And I'm thinking, I was thinking while reading this, uh, you know, you are, you studied in Oxford, you studied in Harvard Business School, uh, you're a writer, and you're talking about not good enough. You're not talking about not being worthy enough. I'd love to hear from you, your ideas on this. Thank you, thank you, Shelja. You know, I think the thing is, um, no matter how much you achieve, you always feel there's much more you can do. And I remember, for example, going to my reunions at Harvard and seeing some of my classmates and they are CEOs, they're running global corporations, they're earning millions of dollars, they're doing amazing things with their life. And you just think, oh my God, you know, I had to leave the family business because they thought that I couldn't handle the stress. And, you know, I, I, I messed up really badly when I was doing the, the job that I really enjoyed, which was journalism. And you feel like inside, you feel like a failure. And I think that um, a lot of us, you know, whether or not we have a mental health condition can empathize with this, that you might seem really talented and successful on the outside, but inside you still feel you're not good enough because you have these benchmarks and comparisons, which are just really hard to fulfill. Um, and, I, and actually, I think this kind of identity crisis was a big trigger for me in my bipolarity. Right. Thank you so much um, for sharing that. Uh, with that, uh, Nirja, if I can come to you, you know, uh, when Aparna was talking about, you know, inside you, you feel like a failure and the benchmark, it made me think about how um, right from a very early age, we are recruiting our children into believing that there's one right way to live their life, to be successful. Otherwise, uh, this idea of being a failure, you know, these benchmarks and these ladder of success that we build for them. Um, and I know you work with children, you work with young people, uh, you work in the corporate sector where this, I guess this ladder of success is even more strong. Uh, I want to know your you know, experiences uh, in the field. Um, hi, Shelja. So, you know, uh, so as a parent, let me tell you first as a parent, actually, because I think um, as a parent, I feel that uh, it's very important that how do you define success? You know, I mean, and that's what I want. That's what I have taught my children, which is which is very important. A lot of times parents define success as, you know, either just academic success or when you're, you know, academic proficiency is considered success. Uh, as you grow up, then your material proficiency or how, what are, you know, the, the bank balance that you have or how you are rising up in the corporate ladder is considered as success. But to me, I think what is important is that holistic life is what I would term as success so and that's what I think it's important to teach the children as well that you know it's you can't just be successful in one bucket of your life and with every other compartment and every other bucket being empty right one has to have that holistic kind of growth and be uh, you know you've got your emotional side which you need to look into your your social side your mental side your spiritual side so i think it's a combination of all of that which really go to make you the way you are and i think seeing that you're doing well in each of those parameters i think i would define that as being uh, you know successful and i think it's important that we as parents also inculcate the same amount uh, that same kind of thinking in our children uh, also, it's very important to inculcate uh, 
um, you know, the habit of being able to take no for an answer. Very often nowadays with us, with us parents, I mean, which was different with, with our parents, but we as parents, um, you know, very easily say yes to most of the things. Uh, and therefore children just don't know how to deal with even that little bit of failure that comes along the way, or they're not, they're not used to having things not go as per their wishes all the time. So I think it's, that also is a very important part, right? I mean, every time you, you don't have to say yes. You, to be able to, uh, you know, fall down and get up, I think also is a measure of how successful you are as a person in your emotional side of things. Thanks, Deja. Um, Shekhar, if I can bring you into this uh, conversation, because this idea of success really, uh, to unpack it, to really understand where does this idea come from and how do we, you know, so many times this, this is what I'm seeing, I'm sure with, when you work with children and young people, whether in your clinic or in the community, this, this is something that is brought up that comes up in our session so often. So I'd love to hear your ideas on this and particularly in the last two years. I'd like to actually combine uh, some of the uh, experiences and ideas that uh, Aparna ji and, and, and Neera ji have, Neerja ji have expressed and combine them together to respond to the issue that you're tabling, uh, Shelja. Uh, Aparna spoke about identity and, and Neerja spoke about success. And uh, if you look at both these in, in the context of parenting and, and socialization, what really defines the identity of, of a growing child? Um, and I have often said both in, in clinical work as well as in the community spaces that we have had the privilege uh, to work and, and assist families and children that uh, if childhood or a child, for example, is defined by studenthood, so a good child is equal to a good student, and therefore a bad student is equal to a bad child. Uh, it's a very reductionist approach to the whole development of the notion uh, and experience of identity. A child is actually equal uh, to a son, a, a daughter, a niece, a nephew, uh, a grandchild, uh, a friend, an Indian, a Delhiite, uh, Hindi and Punjabi speaking uh, disco dancer, music lover, vegetarian, vegan, uh, nature lover, uh, avid traveler, and uh, a student. And uh, so the, the subversion or the usurping of education to actually pander to the whole uh, uh, consumerist uh, uh, corporate culture with apologies to uh, the, the corporate people represented here in this session today, uh, as opposed to education being oriented towards compassion rather than competition, is a way in which tension is created in children's lives where then, uh, you know, success uh, is equated then with, with, with performance that, uh, so, uh, just to close this up and, and, and relate it to the pandemic, uh, I actually wrote a newspaper in the middle once uh, where I said, rejoice, it's examination time. Uh, funny, isn't it? No one ever thought of examinations as a joyous experience. There's always a sense of doom, disaster and finality around it. Whereas examination should actually be a celebration of learning. And it never is because the focus is always on outcome and an achievement, uh, not on process and not on effort. That uh, So I was remarking to a friend of mine who actually is the director of a group of schools to say, why don't you actually hire a field and, and have an examination mela when we come out of the pandemic, of course, and you know set up a mathematics stall and a geography stall and a history stall, have open books and have two teachers standing at the reception and students enter, throw rose water on them uh, so that they enter with a sense of joyousness and the whole sort of uh, uh, specter uh, and the Democles sword of, of uh, success versus failure is really not there that it defines and therefore your well-being is maintained. What has the pandemic uh, therefore done uh, to this whole process and the kind of concerns and anxieties that children are likely to have 
particularly those who are at crucial stages in their academic life cycle, you know, the exit exams that. So while, uh, as has been pointed out, we are likely with the vaccination uh, and uh, the herd immunity and the virus losing its potency and the mutants becoming uh, less potent, the fourth wave is likely to be some of these mental health issues, not necessarily uh, very serious in that sense, but substantive for us to really look at children when they come back to schools as school opens. Safety protocols is one thing. Let's not get preoccupied with learning gap and learning loss and all of that. Just welcome them. Let's have a joyous atmosphere, but look at what circumstance they are coming back to school from, circumstances of pre-existing tensions in the family, what circumstance of their own temperament and uh, let's say mental well-being struggles they've come from. Understand that as emerging narratives and stories. Let children tell their stories, stories of uniqueness, stories of commonalities. Let's build a collective narratives narratives, including stories of strength and stories of resilience and stories of hope to then create an emerging personal identity and a collective identity that then helps them negotiate the exit from the pandemic in the context of this discussion that we're having today. Shelja? Yeah, uh, Shekhar, what you brought up is very important, and I definitely want to come back to this uh, later about stories of resilience and hope. I think sometimes we forget that. Before I, you know, I'm, I'm very, very curious and I'm going to ask you a slightly provocative question because, you know, when you talked about the good uh, student is equal to good child is equal to, you know, I kind of extend that uh, problematic formula is good student is equal to good child is equal to good life, right? So, so as if a bad student is equal to bad child is is bad life. So this particular thing, you know, the question that comes to my mind very often is that despite the growing number of psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, and you have seen, you were my teacher 30, more than 30 years ago, right? You have, and I have, you have more than I have less, the, uh, less of that, that we have seen the growing number of psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors in our country, but the mental health struggles are growing exponentially right? India tops the world in uh, youth suicides. And uh, it's like, if I was to draw a parallel, it's like the Delhi pollution, and we start focusing on children's lungs, rather than looking at what's really creating that. Are we looking for wrong solutions? Are we asking the wrong questions? How Are we locating the problem in children when actually we have to look at the social cultural context where these children are growing up? Children, youth, I mean, both. I have two responses to that, uh, uh, Shelja. Uh, one uh, is a, a more generic and a systemic response. The other is a very specific and a particular response. The generic response is this, that um, what has unfortunately happened uh, in, in mental health, if you look at the prevailing uh, reality, and practices in comparison to the kind of uh, training uh, and discussions uh, that prevailed in the 70s uh, and the 80s where uh, phenomenology and, and therapy and uh, avid uh, discussions and disagreements and, and debate uh, were the order of the day to the, the whole shift into this very clinical uh, practice and, and looking at medical models of the practice of mental health. The unfortunate thing is that the notion that the construction of knowledge uh, comes from uh, double-blind, placebo-controlled uh, studies is a very reductionist approach uh, to mental health. And I would like to call this as the poverty of epistemology because what it misses is the subjectivities of the lived experience of people. And that's what has gone out of training in, in mental health and in the training of people who will form the mental health force uh, to meet the requirements uh, that you have alluded to. So this is the first point that I wanted to make. 
The uh, second uh, issue that I wanted to refer to is if a human being faces a predicament in his or her life, child, adolescent, adult, as the case may be, and the predicament happens to be traumatic in nature, a clinical approach would be to look at it from the construction of what is conventionally called post-traumatic stress disorder, and you treat symptoms. So there is trauma, but there is sleeplessness, so you treat the insomnia, or there is overriding or, or incapacitating anxiety. So, you know, you medicate for the incapacitating anxiety. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. It has its place in severe manifestations of uh, certain clinical conditions. Trauma-informed care, on the other hand, looks at not treating the symptom, but treating the person and the person's sense of what he or she has undergone to look at it from the perspective of his or her subjective experiences, what kind of change or transformation he or she wishes to make, and use methodologies of narratives, of art, of, uh, of theater, of, of, of stories, of, of practice, uh, of, of dialogue and of negotiation to, to really look at healing processes that are strongly embedded uh, in the principles of trauma-informed in care. So with deep respect for that person's choice and opinion. But even there, Shilja, we've made a shift. Now people are shifting from trauma-informed care to healing-centered engagement. Mm -hmm. Because you shifted from symptoms to the person, now you're shifting from the person to the social context in which this has taken place. Because what healing-centered engagement uh, says is that trauma is not an individual experience. It has to be recognized as a collective experience. And indeed, even for the pandemic to really look at the whole intolerance of uncertainty uh, that has uh, enveloped and, and sort of overshadowed people's lives, to look at social cohesion and, and the social context, to really look at social transformations and to look at how people come together collectively. And we can do that as, in schools. We can do that in social collectives. And I look at even this session that we are having today and the location of this session in the Lit Fest that is going to take place as a larger collective in which these kind of ideas are presented to really look at healing-centered interventions that interpret individual trauma from the perspective of the social context in which it occurs. So it is a social context, it is a political context, and that needs to be addressed and changed as well uh, in, in a way that the healing then that takes place is, is powerful and it is uh, over a, a, a period of time that it has longevity, that healing. Shelja? Yeah, thanks, Shekhar. Uh, Nisha, if I can come to you, um... You know, when uh, Shekhar was talking about the context, um, uh, the political, social, cultural context, uh, I was just thinking of this young girl I met today, a 13-year-old, who um, in the last two years uh, has, uh, has kind of shut herself in the, like a lot of children herself in her house and has not had much of social interaction. And now she had the schools are opening and she's going back. And uh, parents reached out to me because of her suicidal experiences. She was talking about killing herself because she, according to her, she's ugly, right? And now going back to school and showing herself to the world seems like a very, very scary uh, experience for her. I'm just kind of thinking this, this I'm hearing more and more of now. How has, um, in, you know, your, you work so much in schools. How has social media, the beauty, the fitness, the diet industry led to this constant self-surveillance uh, in the youth and the children where they're constantly comparing themselves with, you know, all those, uh, whatever they can see on social media and this constant sense of I'm not good enough, I'm ugly. Uh, and I want to kill myself. Uh, so I, I would love to hear from you, your experiences. 
So I think a lot of youth, uh, you know, go through this. I think uh, even just coming back to school has been uh, quite difficult for some of the children, you know, who were who were any case finding it difficult to adjust to school life. And then there was this whole huge, there was this long gap. So returning to school has been difficult for a lot of children where they just don't want to go back to school because of the same thing, because of the fear of, you know, whether it is social anxiety or whether it is just not wanting to meet people. Uh, I think the fear of being ridiculed, um, you know, of not being good enough. And uh, so, you know, all of this has obviously made it difficult for a lot of children. And we've seen that a lot of cases have resurfaced. So a lot of kids who are going through suicidal ideation and, uh, you know, now because school is reopening, are kind of revisiting those thoughts. Uh, even during exams, children find it very difficult to sit for exams. So, you know, we, we take the necessary, we give them the necessary required provisions for that because, you know, you don't want the, um, you know, the year to get wasted for the children. So uh, most certainly we are seeing a lot of it. And like you very rightly said that uh, the number of cases of youth suicide or, uh, you know, in, in the age group of, say, uh, 16 to 18 has really gone up a lot. And more than that, what we're seeing is a lot of suicidal ideation. So, you know, even if, I mean, obviously that's, I mean, no one better than you to know that the journey between the two is 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 long, but even to come, even to have this kind of suicidal ideation, it's really gone up a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, as we all know, social media. I, I don't. I believe that it's multifactorial. Social media does have a part to play because I think, you know, there's this big gap between virtual and real, the real world and the virtual world, and social media really adds to that and paints this very yeah. picture perfect image of everybody, and everybody is just putting, you know, this almost make believe world of what their world is nobody wants to really make themselves vulnerable nobody's putting out what their reality is and everybody puts this you know picture perfect perfect kind of a life that they have whether they are and as we all know that you know there are so many apps on the phone that can that are correcting your face all the time that you don't know what the real you is so i think that also puts a lot of pressure on the youth because they feel that they want to be like this person who actually is, which in itself is a fallacy. Mm-hmm. So yes, there, this gap between the virtual world and real world has created a lot of pressure on a lot of kids. And uh, I think the more we the more we realize, the more awareness that is created around it, I think will really help towards a more preventive sort of action than just being, you know, curative all the time. Mm-hmm. I'm also curious to know, Nirja, I know that your um, organization was doing wonderful work. I think helplines, you started helplines. That's right. Um, I'm very curious to know, during the pandemic, what, what experience did, uh, experiences did you have? What kind of calls were you getting? So we started the... We started coming up. We started the uh, helpline, which is a 24-7 helpline, um, during the first wave of the lockdown. And, uh, you know, a couple of things. One which really is very telling, according to me, and which has been right from the start, is that the number of callers are predominantly male. So about 70 to 80 percent of callers are male uh, as compared to females. That in itself is very revealing that, you know, of course, men also go through their share of issues, but the helpline being incognito actually encourages and helps men talk about it. So traditionally, one feels that, you know, it's only the women, but, you know, the helpline is a fine example of how men are also wanting to come out and speak about it if you've given them the right platform. And the other thing that we saw is at the start of the pandemic, we saw a lot of cases of, uh, you know, obviously a lot of uncertainty because that time nobody knew what was happening, which was coupled with, uh, as you would know, a lot of anxiety and panic and, uh, you know, depressive disorders, a lot of it resurfacing. Um, then we saw a lot of domestic violence coming up. We saw a lot of alcoholism coming up. Uh, you know, then we saw this whole fear about job insecurity. Then we saw a lot of fear about coming back to the world, you know, coming back into routine. How is that going to be? So, you know, it's quite strange, but the the issues with that we've seen on the helpline have been actually uh, quite, you know, varied depending on the phase of the lockdown that uh, we've been going through. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Nija. Um, you know, um, 
Uh, Parnab, uh, Mirja mentioned um, it's something like it's difficult to be vulnerable. And I was thinking the first line, like I read out in your book, is I've lived with bipolarity. And somewhere in your book, you also mentioned, um, I like to say, I, I'm just uh, I'm roughly using your words that I am bipolar. I do not have bipolar disorder. And um, I really want, I was very curious to understand this position you're taking. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, you know, the way I look at my condition and the way I look at um, this illness, it it is an illness, but I am not unwell. I mean, just for the facts, for the last four years, I um, not, I have been pretty stable, um, and I think I've made a recovery. Um, I wanted to write this book actually for a long time, but I just didn't earlier have the distance from the material. So the reason why I say that um, you know I I have this illness, but I am not unwell, or you know I am bipolar, but I don't have a disorder, because first of all, the word disorder to me suggests some sort of malfunction, you know, and I think what I'm really trying to say through this this book is that you can have you can live with bipolarity, you can be bipolar, but you can have what's a so-called normal life, you know, and um, in a way, the way I look at it, it's just like the pandemic has phases. Mental health also has phases. We all live on a spectrum. I may be experiencing a more extreme version of it from time to time, but people go through depression, anxiety, and all of us experience this from time to time, just, just in the way we've gone through these phases of the lockdown. Um, so that was why it was really important for me to distinguish between between the two and say that, you know, um, it's it's a part of my identity. I am bipolar, but I'm also a hopeless cook. And that's part of my identity. <laughs> yeah, it also kind of uh, reminded me of, you know, in the autism world, in the uh, autism rights movement, uh, there is uh, growing awareness on uh, the people talk about, uh, I have autism. So, uh, you know, people who are owning up say, I am autistic, right? So this is, uh, this becomes almost like uh, uh, owning it and becoming one of the identities of the multiple identities. Uh, you know, in narrative practice, we talk about people are multi-storied. So that becomes one story of along, along with hopeless cook and uh, uh, a writer and a mother and uh, writer, so many other stories of that you have talked about. You know, one statement that you, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, you keep referring to in your book uh, when you talk about mental health is a team sport. And that just stayed with me. I thought that could make a brilliant title for the book too. Uh, I'm not suggesting you need to, but you know, mental health is a team sport was such a beautiful way to explain. Can you just tell me what, yeah. how did this- Actually, actually we're hoping to have a whole nother panel with that saying mental health is a team sport. But I think it goes back to what the doctor was saying also that you have to look at the social context. Um, and you know, what I did in the book was, um, I didn't want to just tell my story because I think there have been lots of memoirs, but I interviewed about 75 people, many of them in my ecosystem, right from fa friends, family, colleagues, bosses, spiritual advisors, my fitness trainer, you know, everyone who's interacted with me to get their perspective of how they look at me and what their role is as a stakeholder in managing this uh, condition. And all of them had very interesting perspectives. So I think, let's say if you are a caregiver of any sort or if you happen to be in one of those roles as an ally, I think you would have a very interesting um, maybe perspective um, and hope to gain something from this book. But I think it's really important for us to understand that we all have roles, we are all stakeholders, that this is a community. And like I keep saying that if it takes um, if it takes a, ch a village to raise a child, it takes a community to heal a mind. Um, that was also something that I, I wrote in there. And so I thought it was really important to, to, to focus on these um, team sport aspect. And the therapies that I've outlined in the book, they focus, there are seven therapies which draw from everyday life. They're not something very fancy or new age. Or it's something that is accessible to everybody from all different walks of life. They talk about all, this, all these different aspects of the, of the team sport. Yeah, and uh, you know, somewhere you mentioned uh, with idealism of a 24 year old, I was convinced I could change the world. I'm sure that that idealism is still there with you after all these years. <laughs> That's why we're sitting and having this con uh, conversation. You know, to all the 24 year 
polls out there listening to your conversation, uh, listening to this conversation, what would what words of like, you know, Shekhar talked about stories of hope, what what would you tell them what sustained you what gave what kept you going? I, I think this line um, saying that the purpose of life is a life of purpose. Um, I, I think that's always been a big driver for me. And I, I think that I am still idealistic. Otherwise, I wouldn't write this book and make my life so transparent and get my family's buy-in on, on talking about, you know, all my sort of horror stories from the past. But I think the, the sense of having a purpose is, is really important. And I guess it, it was, you know, Steve Jobs, I think, who said, or maybe he was quoting someone who said that it's, you know, it's only the people who are sort of think that they're crazy enough to change the world who are the ones who end up doing it so i think that you know you you have to look at madness through a certain prism also yeah and i think it's uh, in zorba the greek also right talks about uh, you have to have i'm sure shekhar will be able to help us later with the exact quote that you have to have some madness to uh, live in this world to really uh, get the most of this world nature if i can come to you uh, as we wrap up today's session um I would love to know, uh, you know, if in three words, with your years of experience, uh, in your three words, you could distil, distil, you know, what what are the three things you would say that um, human that takes to for humans to thrive? You know, what are the three things in your experiences in your life, uh, in your as a parent, as a a human, you know, as a mental health activist, what what would you say these three things are? I think I'd say uh, acceptance, uh, resilience, and uh, alacrity. That's the uh, you know the willingness to change and the willingness to maneuver. Yes. Oh, I love that. So acceptance. Uh, second was um, yeah. yeah. Great, beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, Shik, now you you are the one who started with talking about stories of resilience and stories of hope. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very curious to know, I, I know you've done a lot of work uh, with children and resilience. There's a lot of narrative of this doom and gloom that when sometimes we overlook children's abilities to respond to trauma, to adversity, to really endure. I mean, we work with three children and we see that uh, despite the history of abuse and rape and neglect, uh, to reduce them to that victimhood uh, would be pathologi- patholog- pathologizing, you know, years of uh, survival, of resilience, of uh, endurance. I would love to hear your ideas on it. Uh, l- let me address what you're um, saying with uh, some of the issues that uh, Nirja and uh, Aparna also spoke about. I'd like to start, uh, actually, Shalja, with the example that you gave of the 13-year-old and uh, uh, Nirja's responses. Uh, and, you know, since you spoke about this child in a certain predicament and children in vulnerable circumstances, whether their sense of their personal identity or their body image on the one hand or the social street circumstances they come from the other uh, and, and the kind of personal individual vulnerabilities or social vulnerabilities that it it, fail, um, it, it provides uh, for them. The um, I'm reminded of uh, Naomi Wolf's uh, book called The Beauty Myth, uh, the basic premise of which was that uh, as social power and prominence of women uh, increase the pressure that they feel to adhere to unrealistic social standards of physical beauty has grown stronger because of commercial influences of mass media and, and so on. But to the 13-year-old girl that you spoke about, if you really look at how that process occurs as an internal narrative. There is a difference between a person who says, I'm in a difficult situation, I'm in a predicament, as opposed to a 13-year-old who who says that my predicament is intolerable. I do not wish to live, I wish to die, and I wish to kill myself. They are not the same. They are phenomenologically at very different paths of a certain spectrum of, of experience. Now, to link this with what uh, you know, Aparna was talking about, and I love the whole uh, idea of the team game, uh, which is a far more evocative uh, way of putting what 
we now in the initiative that I'm running, uh, the National Initiative on Child Protection and Mental Health and Psychosocial Care, call as transdisciplinary, which is that it's not enough for a professional to diagnose post-traumatic stress disorder uh, in a child. You have to assist the child through the trauma that occurs in legal processes and other processes. It's not enough for a judge to just listen to evidence and adjudicate. Who is the child that you're talking to? Three-year-old? An eight-year-old with hearing and speech disability? What are the mental health and developmental uh, impacts of, of evidence gathering? It is a team sport. And unless we work together in understanding the nuances in a in a transdisciplinary manner, and this applies even more, Shelja, to the kind of children that uh, you speak about and the kind of circumstances that they come from, to create for them an ecosystem or an ecology. And this is why I say that the ecology of a childcare institution is not just a matter of resources and rights. It's a mental health issue. You look at even an MRI or a CT scan and the gantry in which you know you have to go into, 10% of people will say, I'll die of the disease, but I'm not going inside. Claustrophobia. So how does the geography and the ecology of a childcare institution, the ecology of the street, the safety, the play, the stories that emerge provide a certain sustenance, an emotional sustenance, a certain scaffolding and safety net, a, a, a sense of hope, a sense of connection and, and, and affiliation that even though things may have gone wrong, but there is this adult figure that I can go back to or this supportive figure or this peer that I can go back to who listens to me respectfully and with help that, and to build in mental health delivery that kind of ecology or ecosystem which goes beyond clinical and center-based practice of mental health to creating this kind of a system where then the safety net is so strong and, and so extensive that we can provide assistance to more and more people that uh, are in the need for help. Shelja? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, listening to all of three of you, I was just reminded of this, uh, you know, and uh, Aparna's story and the children we work with, I was reminded of this Mexican proverb. They tried to bury me, but they didn't know that I'm a seed. It captures uh, the dignity of the human spirit. Um, people are not passive recipients of extreme hardships. They're always resisting, they're always enduring, and they grow and they grow even stronger. And that's our hope that as we come out of the pandemic, we see the children and the youth and all the people who have um, endured a lot uh, so that we can come together, build a collective. Thank you so much, uh, Aparna. Thank you so much, Nirja. Thank you so much, Shekhar. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shekhar, Nirja, Aparna, and Shelija for an informative session with much needed insights on coping in the post-pandemic world. The session is presented by Blue One Inc. and is part of the Mind and Soul series. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay logged on to continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. Sessions are ongoing across all three of our venues, Front Lawn, Bank of Baroda Mughal Tent, and Darbar Hall. Hope to see you all in the next session. <laughs>